MP for Harlow. He's also the chairman of the Education Select Committee. Luciana Berger is with me. She's a former Labour, Change UK and Lib Dem MP, now Managing Director of Advocacy and Public Affairs at Edelman. And Fran Darlington Pollock is from the Equality Trust and Emma Webb is from the Free Speech Union. They are here, of course, to answer your questions. Two ways you can submit your questions on the phones on 0345 6060 973 or you can text your question to 848. 850. And don't forget, you can watch us also on Global Player on the LBC website at lbc.co.uk or on the LBC YouTube and Facebook feeds. Call 0345 6060 973. Tweet at LBC. Text 84850. Cross question with Ian Dale. This is LBC. Well, welcome to you all. Let's go to our first question. It's from Matthew in Barwell in Leicestershire. Matthew, what would you like to ask? Good evening, Ian. I'd like to ask your panel. Today, Keir Starmer, when asked about drug reform, um, said that he didn't support legalisation of any drugs. I'd like to ask your panel, isn't it the case that the war on drugs has um, failed in a massive way and that actually the only way to deal with the issue is to legalise, to regulate and to spend the money that the Exchequer then gets on programmes to help those with an addiction? Well, we're going to be talking about this in much more detail after nine, so do stay tuned for that. And this is because Sadiq Khan has today suggested that um, l drugs should be decriminalised in London. There's been an experiment in Thames Va within Thames Valley Police, I think, so that that's coming on the back of that. Um, Luciana, let's come to you first. Either you're muted or we've muted you. I don't know which one it is, but... Um, hi, hi there. Let's... Hi. Uh, hi, hi. Hi, hi. Yeah. Um, great to join you. Um, well, first of all, I think it's just worth reflecting on exactly what it is that Sadiq Khan is doing. Um, he is, uh, for those uh, under 25s, found with Class B drugs in some boroughs, um, so that's cannabis, uh, ketamine and speed, they will be offered uh, classes or counselling instead of an arrest, and it's, it's a pilot scheme. Um, I welcome the introduction of that pilot scheme. I think it's very clear in, in too many areas that what we've done so far hasn't worked. And if I kind of reflect on, on, on many different experiences, particularly my time on the Health and Social Care Select Committee, when we actually went to some countries that were looking at new and different approaches, I think the time has come to look at what those new and different approaches could be for our country. Because my concern is it's often those that are the most vulnerable, those that are the most exploited, that pay the price for those people at the top that never pay for the crimes that they do. And we have to do something different. And we have to do something different also to keep people well. And I'm very keen that we should adopt an approach that looks harm reduction rather than criminalisation and, and I welcome what's been introduced as we've had today. Now given Keir Starmer was uh, Director of Public Prosecutions, he said today that he does not wish to see any drugs legalised or decriminalised at all. The government has said exactly the same. Matthew certainly seems to come from the point of view that he thinks that, well, the war on drug drugs has never been won. It probably never will be. So we, we need to think of a new approach. You seem to agree with that. But do you, do you know anything about this Thames Valley Police experiment? Because it has been going on for some time. Do we know that it, what the effects have been at all? I don't believe we, we do. It's just been announced that it's, it's underway, that it's specifically targeting and supporting under 25s. It's not saying that we're, people are completely let off the hook, that they do have to go uh, undergo some treatment and or do some courses that offer that support. Um, it's particularly and specifically for the under 25s. It's also for class B drugs and under, so it's not for um, the most damaging drugs. Like, I, I would be very interested to see the outcome of that, to look at the like, you know, what the actual research shows and what the outcomes have been to kind of change young people's life chances to make a, a difference. Um, again, I, I say that reflecting on too many young people who, um, you know, we should be looking at this through that kind of harm reduction lens rather than um, essentially seeing people um, affected right into their adult lives. Fran Darlington Pollard, let's come to you. Before we come on to the question, just explain a little bit about the Equality Trust. What, what does it, well, I suppose it does what it says on the tin. 
Yeah, largely. I mean, the Equality Trust is a charity. It's been around for around a decade. And the point is it's trying to dismantle structural inequality in the UK and therefore improve quality of life for all and improve well-being. And actually that kind of idea about dismantling structural inequality plays in nicely to this because I think any idea or any approach that is decriminalising issues that are driven by inequality is a, a sort of approach that should be considered and should be debated as a welcome one. Um politicians on on drug policy whenever they're on the back benches they always say yes there needs to be reform and then when they get to be ministers and david cameron was a good example of this um then they suddenly become very conservative in their approach to drugs reform and then when they finish being ministers they go back to their previous position if there is to be a change in the law it needs some politicians who have the courage of their convictions doesn't it i think so and i think that that's a really good point about people kind of backing away from ideas and kind of just doing things perhaps maybe to get into a more positive position in power and then pulling away as soon as they can and kind of just, you know, staying calm. But we do need people to stand up and think, okay, what is the evidence? How can we address these issues? How can we resolve it? And how can we have people carrying that through into parliament, into legislation? Um, Emma, let's come to you. Emma Webb from the Free Speech Union. Um, what Do you think there needs to be a change in approach to drugs policy? I certainly don't think there's anything wrong with uh, trialling new ways of dealing with it. I don't think necessarily having a pilot scheme is a bad idea. The argument, of course, in favour of decriminalisation is that you can get tax revenue from it. It's been tried around the world, as uh, Luciana has already mentioned. Um, there have been pilots elsewhere. This pilot scheme is looking to, um, to test this out in three uh, London boroughs, so Bexley, Greenwich and Lewisham. Um, however, this is obviously, it, you know, it conflicts with the government's approach. It conflicts with the Labour Party's approach, as Keir Starmer made quite clear. Um, my inclination is uh, not towards uh, decriminalising, but I certainly don't think that getting evidence um, for or against that approach is necessarily a bad thing. So um, while I don't personally know necessarily what the solution is, um, I think that possibly in this instance, Sadiq Khan's suggestion of piloting this may be obviously coming following um, Boris Johnson's announcements late last year to do with drugs policy and cracking down um, on drug use, that this um, is a political decision on his part rather than um, necessarily as I would take it. This is coming from, um, you know, a position of wanting to get the evidence and see whether or not it, it is, a, is, a, is a better and more effective approach. Challenge you, Emma. I'm really sorry if I can, but I, on, I, met, I met the director of public health when I was formerly the shadow minister for public health um, back in 2013-14, and this is a scheme that they've been advocating for many, many years. And these are the these are the officials; these are not politically appointed people that have been making the case for an extended period of time to try and do something different. So I, I know we're always looking to um, kind of put a political uh, angle on it and, and say that people aren't doing it for the best intentions, but this has largely been driven by the civil servants who themselves are public health experts and to actually address the situation from a harm reduction perspective. Rob Halfon, let's go back to Matthew's question. He, he reckons the only way to deal uh, with the drugs problem is legalisation and rehabilitation. Is that a policy that the opposition should be adopting? Well, obviously, you're, you're a Conservative MP, but do you accept that the current laws aren't working and therefore, as Emma says, um, a pilot scheme might be a good thing? Um, well, first of all, Happy New Year to you and everybody on the panel. What I think this is wrong-headed, I'm sorry to say to Matthew, because his basic question is, should we be legalising um, drugs? And if you legalise them, what are you going to do? Are you going to tax them? Well, we tax cigarettes, and there's a lot of smuggling of, of cigarettes. You'll still have a black market in drugs because um, there'll be some kind of strengths or types that people will still want um, because the legal framework may not necessarily cover it. Um, so you won't get rid of crime. That's the first thing. Um, it will carry on existing just as, as crime exists for illegal illegal drugs and as smuggled alcohol and uh, much more besides. The second thing is I think that uh, decriminalisation is wrong because what you're doing is giving a signal to uh, young people that uh, these kind of drugs are OK uh, to take. And in essence, you're going to get away with it if you take. And the research that has been done even on soft, so-called soft drugs like cannabis causing schizophrenia and other things and that they're a gateway to harder drugs 
is quite has quite extensive over the uh, uh, past few years. And I think what um, Sadiq Khan is proposing is incredibly damaging because whilst people may say it's a pilot scheme for certain parts of London, what he's doing is giving a signal uh, as mayor is that um, uh, taking drugs is OK under his under his watch. And I'm actually very glad that Keir Starmer um, oppose, seemed to oppose this strongly uh, today. Um, so if you go by what you've just said, you must think that the current system is perfect. It doesn't need no, to be changed at all. absolutely not. I think that a lot more uh, money and investment needs to go into a rehab. And uh, I've seen incredible programmes, um, incredible charities. I've visited them both in my constituency and some around the country in Birmingham. And I visited some in Boston in my time where... Um, what a huge amount of work goes on to deal with uh, drug addiction and getting people back to back to work. I'd like to. I don't think the rehab program is invested in enough. Um, I'd like our government to do much more on that and look at innovative schemes that that actually work and education programs in our schools, uh, more education programs in our schools to get people off of drugs. But saying there uh, to legalise them is, is, is in, as I say, in my view, the entirely wrong way to go about it. Um, anybody want to come back before I go back to Matthew? I, I just say that this is a pilot and it's a pilot to kind of address Luciana. the situation where it's a, it's, a, it's a pilot to try and address a problem which so far hasn't been properly addressed. We are seeing you know, we're seeing people, people. We're not seeing a decrease in the people like losing their lives from drug addiction in this country. And and again, this is something that disproportionately impacts. As Fran uh, Fran has said, those people um, that are most disadvantaged. And and we should be doing everything possible to to help them. I, I agree with Rob about um, rehabilitation and addiction programs. I'd like to see so many more of them. If you look at the figures, we've seen like literally like millions and millions of pounds of those programs cut. So, you know, that is one element of it. But this is not decriminalisation. This is um, this is essentially trying to do something to change people's lives for the better. He's giving and, and a terrible signal across okay. London that the mayor of London is in essence decriminalising drug, drugs. And if you're a uh, um, uh, uh, taking drugs in Hendon and you're being uh, arrested for it, what's to stop you saying, well, actually, why is it OK for the guy in Lewisham to get away with it? I think this is a disastrous policy and I hope it's uh, rethought. I th well, I, as I, I say... Well, sorry, sorry, Luciana. As I say, we're going to be talking about this much more on the programme after nine o'clock. So if you'd like to take part in the debate, then you'd be very welcome to. We've got lots of calls coming in on all sorts of different subjects. We'll put those to our panel in just a moment. You're listening to Cross Question on LBC. It's quarter past eight. This is LBC.
Cross Question with Ian Dale on LBC. Call 0345 6060 973. 17 minutes past eight with me, Rob Halfon, Conservative MP for Harlow, Luciana Berger, former MP and now Managing Director of Advocacy and Public Affairs at Edelman, Fran Darlington-Pollock is from the Equality Trust and Emma Webb is from the Free Speech Union. Uh, Chris in Richmond is with us again. Chris, very good evening to you. Happy New Year. What would you like to ask? Happy New Year, Ian and the panel. Um, uh, does the panel believe that it was right to give Tony Blair a knighthood? Uh, let's go to Rob Halfon. Um, yes, I, I do. I think actually, of course, I have my disagreements. I'm from a different political party, but I think that uh, Tony Blair did some very good things in our country. He brought in the, the minimum wage, made the independence of the Bank of England. He started the academy programme. He transformed the Labour Party, although it was destroyed by Jeremy Corbyn. Um, he made sure that my party had to become much more electable. And we had David Cameron as leader because we were in uh, the dark years of opposition thanks to uh, Tony Blair and I think this is this opposition to his knighthood is ridiculous I think that Tony Blair has I you know there's arguments about him in the Iraq war or well, whatever your views about the Iraq war the truth is that whilst the spinning was bad um, he did save the Kurdish nation a place where I've been to uh, the Kurdish region of, of Iraq about seven times in my political life saved them from annihilation because Saddam had made it very clear he was going to commit genocide and had already dropped mustard gas on uh, on Halabjum uh, years before. And I think people forget about that. Um, so whilst I certainly disagree with things on what Tony Blair did, his views on, on Europe, I think he deserves it. Uh, and uh, I think he shouldn't have had to wait 15 years, um, uh, to, to be honest. And, and I think that actually uh, my party and people on the right should be much more respectful of what he achieved and recognise that uh, this is this is a gong that uh, was deserved. I don't remember you saying any of those things when he was in power. <laughs> yeah, well, because of course um, you're in opposition and opposition is very tribal, um, Ian, as you well know, and uh, you can reflect over the years. I think he's Tony Blair in the pandemic has, has has come out with some very good advice. I don't love the guy. I don't think he got everything right. I don't agree with him on everything at all. Um, I don't think uh, he understood the Brexit uh, argument at all. Um, but nevertheless, for the reasons I've given, he deserves he deserves the the uh, knighthood from the Queen. Absolutely. Um, Emma Webb, let's come to you. Let's look at this from a free speech point of view because there are a lot of people that whenever Tony Blair is mentioned, they, they kind of want to shut a debate down, it seems to me. We get that a lot whenever you mention his name in a phone and on uh, LBC. Some people just sort of lose all sense of perspective. Uh, and yet... Um, the Labour Party at the moment, Keir Starmer made his speech this morning and almost embraced Tony Blair, the first time a Labour leader has done that in many, many years. Um, do, first of all, do you think he should have been given a knighthood? And second of all, what do you make about the what do you make of the debate that's been going on over the last few days? I absolutely agree um, with um, what Robert Alphon has just said, that, um, you know, regardless of where you stand politically, I do think he should um, be given the knighthood. I think, you know, I personally disagree with Tony Blair on uh, almost everything, many things, um, his legacy uh, regarding immigration, um, the Iraq war, obviously it's a debate that is extremely febrile and people have very, very strong opinions on it. But ultimately um, this knighthood is uh, given by the Queen. It's the Order of the Garter. This isn't something that is coming um, from the government. Um, it's something that the Queen <coughs> decision to do. Um, and I think that in that respect, um, I think Charles Moore made a, a very a good point about this is that, you know, perhaps like Harold Macmillan, he could have refused um, he could have refused the honour. Um, but I think fundamentally, you know, Tony Blair is a historic prime minister standing alongside Clement Attlee and Margaret Thatcher. Whether you agree with him or not, he took the Labour Party out of 18 years of wilderness, um, you know, three terms, landslide victories. He's somebody who, whether you agree with him or not, is certainly a, a sort of towering figure in British political history. Um, and in that respect is, is deserving of the knighthood. Um, and on the point of free speech, I think, 
you know, this is a very febrile debate. People have very strong views. And um, often in, in febrile de public debates like that, you do have people who want to shut down those who disagree with them. And I think um, the, the, the point that was already made about, you know, being able to acknowledge and respect the other side, whether or not you disagree with them, as an, whether, you, whether or not you agree or disagree with them, is a very important one. And um, so, you know, even though I personally disagree with him, I do think that he should have got the knighthood. Luciana. Well, I, I share many of the of the comments and views that, have, that you've heard already, perhaps not all from the same perspective, but I, I joined the Labour Party um, under Tony Blair. And I would also say, you know, I'm, I would also say, I mean, the, the list of his achievements as a prime minister in our country for 10 years is, is considerable. And um, whether it's the introduction of the minimum wage, opening over 3,000 children's centres, investing in our health and education in a way that we hadn't seen before that and for many, many decades, banning fox hunting. And for me, most importantly, was the introduction of uh, everything that did that moved this country forward when it came to equalities that um, at the end came at the end of the Labour government came to the introduction of the Equalities Act. It was something that I was passionately um, involved in as a student and what motivated me to get politically active and what, what I think has changed this country for the better. And he, in uh, Labour history, is the only Prime Minister to have won um, the majorities and the and the sustainable working commons majorities that he has this is a decision of the queen and, and i think it's the right one Fran Darlington Pollock, what, what do you think? Because from an equalities point of view, it's difficult to argue that Tony Blair didn't do a, a lot to improve equality in the country yeah, but I think that a bigger issue here, and I'm actually going to pounce on something that Emma said, she said acknowledge and respect, and we should acknowledge and respect people on both sides of what they've done. And actually the debate we're having here is devaluing a system of honours, which I think is problematic in the first place. The point of an honour system is to recognise contributions people have made to our society. And every time we have a kind of question mark around an honours given, whether that's the Prime Minister giving it or the Queen giving it, every time we see a scandal behind it or something revoked, we're devaluing the honour, the respect, the acknowledgement that we should be giving to everyday people who these honour systems are actually perhaps more valuable for. So I think the bigger debate we should be having, which kind of underpins this question of should he or should he not be given a knighthood, is the legitimacy of the honour system itself. And that's to do with equalities. Well, we might get a question on that later, you never know. Um, thank you for your answers on that. Um, Chris, what's your view? Um, well, as far as I'm concerned, he's still the best Prime Minister in my lifetime. 48 years. Yes, he made mistakes over the Iraq war, um, but, you know, as, as Robert mentioned, the Kurds and, and what, happened, what had happened to them, I'm Saddam Hussein, I think 1988, record investments in health and education, great work in equalities, and, um, you know, like Margaret Thatcher, he advanced this country, whether you love him or hate him, so I think it's an absurd uh, discussion to be trying to remove the, the gong from him, especially when people like, say, David Cameron's um, former hairdresser and Sam Cam's assistant were given gongs a few years ago. So uh, I think we all have to put it into perspective. I don't, I don't think they were quite given knighthoods, were they? But anyway, Chris, thank you very much indeed. Let's move on to James in Ayrshire. James, hello. What's your question, please? Yeah, hello, hello, Ian, and happy New Year to you and the panel. And um, my question relates to an extraordinary statistic I heard in a, radio, a BBC radio programme this morning. Apparently in the 2019 election, if only the the votes of over 60s were counted. The Conservative Party would have won all by five constituencies in England and Wales. Conversely, if only the votes of under 30s were counted, Jeremy Corbyn would have won a landslide majority. Are the panel concerned by both of these statistics, as indeed I am? That is a really good question. I must admit, I didn't realise the figures were that stark. I wonder if anybody's done any comparative work on that, saying, well, what, would it have been the same in 1983 or 1955 or whenever? Um, Fran, let's come to you first. Yeah, it's a really interesting one. Thank you. And I think the word gerontocracy, isn't it? This idea around the kind of when you have a, a growing older population, their political views might kind of dominate and then who 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 has the power? And I think the problem here is that we have this polarised system where people are seeing their interests represented in different ways by different segments of society and so if people age 60 and over for example feel more represented by conservatives whereas people um, in the younger age groups feel more represented by somebody like Jeremy Corbyn that's a big problem because we're all in the same society and we should all be seeing it in, in a kind of way of a system of, of reciprocity of equality so if 
one whole group is just dominating and that's the view that's the interests that are being looked after by a political party that is problematic but it's only problematic if younger people don't vote isn't it because if, if everybody voted you wouldn't have this polarization Perhaps, but then we need to ask why aren't people voting? What is it about our current political system that means people feel disenfranchised? We should never just fall back on the assumption that because people aren't voting, their voices aren't worth hearing. We should ask why is it they're not voting? What can we do to empower them to feel involved in politics? And what can we do to our system to make sure that everybody's represented? We um, people on this panel who are or have been politicians do that because they want to serve people, they want to serve their community they presumably want to serve everyone in that community to the best of their interests. So part of that should be ensuring that those people's voices can be heard. And that should be a way of thinking, OK, why aren't these people voting and how do we get them to vote? Rob Halfon, there must be a tendency to, when you know that the overwhelming majority of older people vote, I think the turnout for over 60s is something over 80%, whereas under, under 25s, I don't know what the figure is, but it, it's, a, it's a fraction of that. So the, the tendency must be for all the policy planners in all the political parties, particularly maybe yours, is to direct policy at the older generation and, and effectively not concentrate too much on the younger generation because they don't vote. Well, I think it's a really uh, original question and very thoughtful question from from uh, from James. And you, you do have a point. Um, it's, it is true that uh, younger people, the younger they get, the less likely they are to, to vote. And if they want to change the system or change political parties, then they, they, they should vote. Everybody has an, an, an equal an equal vote. But I would like us to be a more of a one nation party. I think the work that the government is doing on apprenticeships is huge and the lifetime skills guarantee. Um, I want us to do more work on degree apprenticeships so we can offer, you know, so students don't get mired in loans, but we can offer every student who wants one a chance to do a uh, an apprenticeship at university, university level, earn while they learn, get a skill, have no debt um, and get a good job at the end because we know that 90 percent of apprentices who complete get good good jobs and if we can offer young people the skills uh, they need the training that they need both through apprentices and the lifetime skills guarantee that the chancellor is spending billions of pounds on i think perhaps more young people will vote of course the elephant in the room is the housing problem and a lot of young people are affected by that um, i suspect it's one of the reasons why um, yeah, not enough young people vote uh, for my party, for the Conservative Party. I think we have to be very bold on this. It is crazy that something like 90% of our land is not built on. Uh, there's an apocryphal story, I don't know how true it is, that there are more golf courses in the United Kingdom than there is land that has houses uh, on it. And we have to be very brave and and make a decision for a mass house building program it's when we built houses um it's when uh, and young people can afford to uh, either rent or buy um that um the conservative party have been successful and there was a very just a final thing i'll say there's a very interesting article in the economist some uh, months ago the economist magazine which um, said actually um, Boris didn't just win the red wall seats because of Brexit but because in some of these seats there's been a lot of new housing developments and it's cheaper to live there and you have aspirational families who move to those houses who are able to afford them and who then subsequently are more likely to vote for uh, the Conservative Party. Um, so well, you know, put that thought out there um, of course, it was just one article, but we have to build more houses because um, our young people are, are, it's wrong that so many young people cannot afford to uh, uh, to either rent or to um, buy a first house unless they've got a wealthier parents to help them. Well, all I can say, Rob, is keep keep your thieving hands off the Royal Cromer Golf Club golf course because yeah. I'd be very unhappy if houses were built well, on that. But hey. Again, because all the science <laughs> boys like you um keep using any 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 policies no 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 i'm 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 actually not, i'm actually not not part of that group in fact the very opposite All right we're going to come to emma and luciana after the lbc news at 8 32 with zora suleiman the prime minister insists that he's sticking to plan b covid restrictions in england however boris johnson has set out plans for daily testing for 100,000 critical workers to help ensure vital services can continue some non-urgent 
urgent surgery and appointments are being paused across hospitals in Greater Manchester due to the rising impact of COVID and staff shortages. The hospital trust says cancer and urgent care patients, including those due to undergo cardiac surgery, vascular surgery and transplants, will not be affected. And the judge presiding over the Duke of York's civil sexual assault lawsuit says he'll come to a decision about whether to dismiss the case pretty soon. Prince Andrew's been accused of abusing Virginia Dufrey when she was 17, something that he has always denied. LBC weather breezy and chilly for all tonight. Clear spells will develop across most of the UK with further wintry showers across western and northern areas. Strong winds are likely across the north, a low of freezing. This is LBC. Hi. Question with Ian Dale on LBC. 8.35 on LBC. We're in the middle of answering a question from James in Ashere. He's asked, are you worried about the generational divide given that uh, so many more people from an older generation vote Conservative and so many more people from a younger generation vote Labour? Uh, let's go to Emma Webb from the Free Speech Union. Emma, what, what, are you worried about this generational divide? I mean, you are from, for people who can't see you, you are undoubtedly from a younger generation. I should be um, absolutely clear that everything that I say is on my own behalf and not on behalf of the Free Speech Union. These are my personal opinions. Um, I'm, I'm not worried about that. I, I think that actually this issue is um, is a very complicated one. And before the pandemic um, arose, we heard a lot about uh, the great realignment in our politics um, along cultural lines rather than economic lines. And I think um, the younger generation and, you know, not only the younger generation, but the general, um, the general zeitgeist within our politics is moving away from those old divisions between, um, you know, along economic lines and more along cultural lines and other factors as well. And I think that both parties um, are struggling to adapt to that and struggling to find their identity and their place within that. Um, so I think actually that any generational divide um, between older and younger voters, um, and as you say, older voters tending to vote conservative. I, of course, know many um, young voters who who are, who are you know conservative activists or vote conservative. 
Um, I think that that is is part of a bigger picture of a realignment within our politics. And we've seen that today with Keir Starmer's speech. Um, the Labour Party is also trying to, to find its feet in a new atmosphere. Um, and the pandemic is going to play into that as well. So this is something I think that um, has a lot of different aspects to it and needs to be viewed in that bigger perspective. Uh, Luciana, hasn't uh, Luciana Berger, hasn't it always been thus that older people tend to be more right wing and younger people tend to be more left wing? Has anything really changed? Well, that, that is certainly the, the case from all political studies in this country. But I think that the, the number of this question speaks to the, the point about how do we make politics relevant to all ages and particularly increasingly to younger generations who are not increasing their voter turnout, they're decreasing their voter turnout. I think there's, there's so much that we could be doing as a country. I'm a massive advocate for, whether you want to call it civics or political or um, community education, um, starting from a young age. I, I certainly didn't have it, but I know the difference it, it can make since we've, we've seen um, that introduced uh, in, in some places of education. We need to see younger representatives involved at all levels of public life. When, when I came into Parliament, I was 28, and there was people that were saying that we shouldn't have any politicians under the age of 40. And um, we've seen that mix up a little bit more, but still, um, you know, when people switch on the, ha the TV and see the Parliament channel and see a House of Commons that still largely doesn't reflect the breadth and width of, of uh, British society and also doesn't see um, younger faces or as many younger faces as they should do. People ask the question, like, how how is that relevant to me and, and why is this going to make a difference to my life? And in particular, because, you know, we, historically this country has seen every... Um, next generation do better than the last and I don't think we can apply that same principle to younger people today particularly um, in the midst of a pandemic when it's the younger generations that have been disproportionately impacted at all levels of education have had not had the same experiences you heard Rob talk about the challenges of young people being able to have a home you know, increasing levels of um, generation rent or generation boomerang of young people having to go back to their parents and if governments successive governments aren't and particularly over the course of the last 11 years, we haven't seen a government um, ensure that this generation does better than the last. Then there's a reason why they're politically um, less inclined. And that, for me, is the number of the question and the issue that we need to seriously address. Uh, James, you asked the question. What do you make of what you've heard? I, I, I agree with all your speakers, apart from your penultimate one, Ian. Two suggestions. Under 30 only shortlists for constituencies and lower the voting age to 16 as we have here in Scotland for some time. Maybe controversial, but nonetheless, to me, it's a practical way forward. Under 30 only shortlist. Well, that's one I haven't heard before. That that, <laughs> that would certainly shake things up a bit, wouldn't it? Um, we might talk about that on the programme another time. James, thank you. Let's move on. Sorry. You know, I was going to say, I'd love to see the votes at 16 campaign for real, get some real momentum. And, you know, it, it's been going for quite a few years and there is, I think, a growing level of support for it. But I do think it will make a massive difference in this country to engage in that next generation. So I hope that we can see uh, one day in the not too distant future, 16 year olds getting the vote. Right. Let's move on to another question from Jerry in Whitley Bay. Jerry, go ahead. Hi. Hi, Ian. Um, has Keir Starmer fundamentally lied in obtaining the Labour leadership. And I refer particularly to statements like um, common ownership, uh, not trashing the last four years, uh, stop taking lumps out of each other, uh, immigration pledges, and then roundly sacking at the first opportunity Long Bailey, Corbyn, Russell Moyle, MacDonald, and attempting to get rid of Angela Rayner. It doesn't seem to me like his original leadership pledges are being honoured in any way. Not sure all of that totally stands up to scrutiny, but um, I hear what you say. Let's go to Rob Halfon first. Well, I'm wary of intruding into private grief here between different factions of the Labour Party. But uh, just uh, to answer more seriously um, in terms of Keir Starmer's speech, I think clearly, obviously, he's made baby steps towards moving away from the... Uh, awful Corbyn years that, as I said earlier, destroyed the Labour Party that Tony Blair had uh, created, the new Labour. Um, but uh, the problem is, where is the where is the beef? Because on the hard choices, um, nothing, there's been nothing. It's all right to say words like security, prosperity uh, and respect, motherhood and apple pie, words that we all agree with. 
But where are the tough decisions? What tough, name one tough spending decision uh, that the Labour Party has made, because they say the government should spend more on everything and never, ever uh, say, well, we're going to take a very tough... No, but the, the, the question was specifically about pledges he made in his leadership campaign, which, according to Jerry, he's broken. Well, as I say, um, that to me is um, a matter for the internal Labour Party factions to fight it out. I've, I've no idea whether uh, Keir Starmer has broken um, um, Labour pledges, but in terms of the, speech, the pledges he made in his speech, but as I say, in terms of what he's trying to do with the Labour Party, he's made some nice noises and some baby steps, but the Labour Party have not taken any tough decisions about, okay. about anything, um, and until they do... Um, they won't, OK, they're ahead in the opinion polls now, but they won't uh, be uh, in government until they're ready to take tough decisions when the public see them making tough and controversial decisions. Emma Webb. Um, again, I, I'm not sure whether um, he has broken his election pledges. I think that he's um, clearly, as you know, Robert Helfen's already mentioned, he's he's trying to move away from the Corbyn years. And I, as I said myself already, I, I think that... Keir Starmer and, and the Labour Party in general are struggling to um, struggling to find themselves in many ways. Um, I fear this is probably not a good enough answer to the question because I'm not sure whether he's broken his pledges. Um, but all of the talk of um, a new contract with the British people um, and and as as you mentioned, uh, security, prosperity. These are all things that are very easy to say, but actually. Um, when you when you look at it, there isn't actually very much meat there, um, and I'm not sure whether you know we we already talked about Tony Blair, and one of the things that Tony Blair certainly did well was that he was a formidable um, he was a formidable uh, a political opponent. He was he was um, you know a, a, so, someone who uh, forced the Conservative Party to um, really up its game, uh, and I fear that Keir Starmer, you know, apart from whether or not he's he's is meeting um, the ple the pledges that he set out in his campaign. I think that um, that he's he's fundamentally failing to be a worthy opposition. And this was a point that Tim Stanley made in the Telegraph, which is that the Conservative Party and the Labour Party just seem to be co you know copying each other um, in this sort of constant reciprocal way and I think that um, Keir Starmer is really going to have to put some meat on the bones in order to, to step up his game Okay, uh, friend Darlington Pollock Well I think that people who were in, in support of Corbyn will have grievances and I think people who were in support of Starmer will have grievances around um, the pledges that he made but I think that um, one of the issues that we also need to address is that perhaps there isn't enough meat on any of the speeches we're getting from our political leaders at the moment on either side of the political spectrum. And the problem is that we we really do need quite a strong opposition as any government, any country needs at any point. But in time of crisis, there needs to be a kind of really clear, this is the way to um, challenge, this is how we're going to like pull things out, really, really um, get to the to unpack what's going on or what should be done. And perhaps that's not been done as carefully as it should have been. So people will have grievances in that way. But whether or not he has explicitly broken election pledges, I think I agree with Robert Helfen that this is something for the internal workings of the Labour Party to, to debate. Well, Luciana, you're very familiar with the internal workings of the Labour Party. You left the Labour Party over anti-Semitism under Jeremy Corbyn. Um, in, in terms of Jerry's question, he wants to know whether you think that he, he essentially lied to win the leadership of the Labour Party. Um, he's more your sort of politician, isn't he? Are, are you considering rejoining Labour? Well, first answer your question also, like I, I'm not a member of the Labour Party, so uh, and I wasn't involved... Um, at that time in that internal election. And so I can't tell you either way what, what the pledges were and whether he has yet to deliver on them or not. Um, I, I can reflect on, on the reasons why I left the Labour Party and that it's absolutely right that this country has a proper working uh, opposition uh, and that you know, Jeremy Corbyn nearly destroyed the Labour Party, I believe, and it's right that we have a wholesale refresh and restart. <laughs> That's a that's a that's a journey. Uh, it's a journey amongst the pandemic. It's a pretty tricky time, but um, uh, I think that the Labour Party is on 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 a new path, and it's it's a it's a welcome path, and it's got some new fresh faces in it as well that I think are really making a difference to holding this government to account. I just heard on the news before you had West Streeting, for example. Um, so there is a job to be done, but um, um, time will tell to see how it all pans out. 
Louise Ullman has rejoined the Labour Party. She says Keir Starmer is a new broom. He, he's, uh, I, I don't think she said he's actually rid the party of anti-Semitism, but he's certainly um, going in the right direction. You, you haven't rejoined. Um, can you see a point in the future where you might? I'm taking a step back from kind of all personal political activity. Um, I just needed some time out after what was a, a very, very, very difficult time in my last few years in the Labour Party. Um, I'm looking to see the progress that's been made and, and is being made uh, within the Labour Party. It's, it's fair to say there was a big job to be done. It's the first political party to have been found to be institutionally racist by the Equalities and Human Rights Commission after the BNP. As a, I should say, the main one of the main work. Um, kind of, parties in parliament rather than kind of a fringe party you know that is a, a, a very very serious um situation for any party to find itself in and there's a lot of work to be done to rectify it in the wake of that so um, i'm obviously following what's happening closely from the outside and, and i will um, watch that progress as it progresses you're not ruling it out are you i can tell um i um, i've taken a step back it's as i said it was <laughs> Uh, it okay. seems like only yesterday, but you know, it's it's it is yeah. It's a, it was it was a very very difficult time. I don't think anyone um, who serves for a party as I did for nearly ten years makes a decision lightly to leave their political home. Um, it was one kind of fraught with with many many difficult challenges, and and I think there are many people that um, will never forgive what happened under the last leadership on many different levels, not just to do with anti-Semitism but Brexit and many other things as well. Um, that meant that this country didn't have a proper working, uh, functional, and uh, appropriate uh, and uh, just 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 any any you know, that had any standing whatsoever when it came to an opposition and um, this this country deserves that this population deserves that. our country deserves it and it didn't have it um, and it takes it takes a long time to come back from that well here's here's a good idea how about you run against jeremy corbyn in islington in the next election because labor will be looking for a candidate to do so if, if they don't allow him back i mean I, I don't know what the labor party is going to decide when it comes to um <laughs> readmitting jeremy corbyn uh, I'm, I'm not taking that as a no. Um, thank you very much indeed. We'll come back to you in a moment for more questions. It's 8.49. This is LBC. <laughs> Leading Britain's conversation. Cross question with Ian Dale. Tweet at LBC. 
It's 8.52. Let's go to a text question from Nadim in Eltham. The actress Emma Watson has been accused of anti-Semitism by Israel's former ambassador to the UN after posting a message of support for the Palestinian cause on social media. Is it really anti-Semitic to write solidarity is a verb? Um, Luciana, I'm going to come to you first on that. In an answer, no, it wasn't. Um, you know, uh, that, that there's been I mean, lots of discussion all day on social media about this particular post. That was not an anti-Semitic post. Um, it's uh, it's within M. Watson's rights to post what she would like. Um, I think what's really important when it comes to the Israeli-Palestinian conflict that it's not about taking sides, and it's about understanding um, two very different experiences um, and two very different narratives and a very, very fraught and challenging situation which none of us can even begin to understand because we don't live in the region. Um, but I don't believe that that post specifically was anti-Semitic. Do, do you think it is becoming a problem that any criticism of Israel uh, as a country or the Israeli government is now construed by some people as being anti-Semitic? Well, I don't believe that's the case because you don't, you know, if that was that, if that was true, you'd see these debates surface every single day. That's not the case. Um, uh, and certainly, you know, we live in, in a country where we can have debate and discussion and we should do. Um, I, I think it's, you know, it, it's complex and, and people should spend the time to understand uh, a bit more of the history, that it's not black and white and, and you know, there's many different complex um, issues that are going on in the region. Um, but I wouldn't attest that we're now in a position today where, where you know, any, any criticism is seen as anti-Semitism. I don't believe that's where we're at. Um, Rob Halfon, you used to be director of the Conservative Friends of Israel. Um, you, you've got a lot of views on the whole Israeli issue. What's your answer to Nadim's question? It's, it's, uh, Emma Thompson uh, this is not my cup of tea, but if she had said... Emma Watson, not Emma Thompson. Emma Watson, oh, sorry, Emma Watson, I beg your pardon. But if she had said, um, we support Hezbollah now, all Zionists are killers or... Uh, something like that, then I would have had a problem with it. But just to say solidarity with the Palestinians, I think it's pretty pretty harmless, and you know, and it's up to her what she what she wants what she wants to do. I don't you know necessarily agree with everything um, in terms of the Palestinian cause. Obviously, coming from a, a Jewish background, just to take up the point that you said, I don't think it's fair to say that all criticism is of Israel is seen as anti-Semitic. It's just the problem is the where the kind of criticism and when people can march in the street shouting we are all Hezbollah now and so-called respectable people stand at those demonstrations supporting Hamas and, and Hezbollah and Islamic Jihad that's when it is, is anybody shouting that yes it happens all the time in demonstrations you've had the um, leader of the NEU um, um, go to uh, one of those de demonstrations and speak at those demonstrations have, uh, people from the Labour Party the, all the Corbynistas in the past so that is where it goes beyond the boundaries of normal and fair support for the Palestinian cause to to serious anti-semitism uh, and uh, uh, I think that is where it's got to, where it's got to stop um Emma, in terms of your work at the Free Speech Union, obviously th this is quite a tricky one, isn't it? Because everyone will have a different dividing line here. What, what will be acceptable to some people to say in public or to write on a tweet or whatever is not acceptable to others. How should we handle this in terms of free speech? It is a tricky one, and I wouldn't I wouldn't want to speak on behalf of the free speech organisation on this because... Uh, uh, well, why, why not? You're from them. That, that's kind of why uh, you're on the programme. Yeah, well, absolutely, but um, I, I, I don't know what um, the Free Speech Union's specific line on this issue would be, and I actually haven't seen... Um, well, sure, surely you support all free speech? Yeah, absolutely, I do. Um, I haven't seen this particular tweet, but, um, you know, I do think that um, it's extremely important <laughs> people uh, are able to, to um, you know, make uh, criticisms of Israel, to, to speak out on political issues. I don't think that people should um, be silenced... Um, for expressing their political views in any way whatsoever, as you say, um, you know, this is, it is it is a very complicated um, it is a very complicated issue because people do have different views on what what should be described as being anti-Semitic or not. But um, my personal view is that um, I, I do support all, all speech, um, and so I think that it's important that people should be able to express their their personal opinions on any political matter. Fran. Yeah, I mean, the tweet itself, what was it, the um, solidarity is a verb. To say that kind of thing 
isn't intrinsically something that you shouldn't say and things need to, we need to be careful not to take things out of context we need to be careful to ensure that we have a very good understanding of the debates or, or the tensions that we're talking on and simply just to use one person's tweet who's a big personality who has a lot of followers and try and pull that to polarize debates further is not really a line that we should be going down Right, final text question for the end. Uh, Diane in Twickenham asks, what are your New Year's resolutions? Not a particularly original question, but um, let's go around the panel. Um, Luciana, what's yours? Mine is to laugh more and worry less. So I booked to go see loads of comedians this year because they've all gone back on tour. <laughs> well, you've laughed a lot this evening. Uh, Rob? So well, my, I did say to uh, my wife a few days ago, my New Year's resolution was not to get covid and i've just been diagnosed with it today so uh, um, um i don't think I've, I've followed that one but i had another one because i'm a fanatic to tolkien fan and it was his birthday yesterday and i've read lord of the rings and the silmarillion and the unfinished tales i've never read the 12 volumes of middle earth so that's my was my planet <laughs> for the year ahead and maybe we can come back next year ian and you can ask me if i've read them or not I, I might well do that well i think it's very heroic of you to come on tonight when you've just been done are you feeling okay yeah just a a fluey and a bit of a tight mm. chest but uh you know how can i resist coming on your program yeah well thank i i, I regard it as a huge compliment uh fran um, you know, as we're trying to emerge out of the kind of like the horrors of COVID and all our business is going terribly for everyone, uh, my new resolution is to be a conscious consumer, slot, shop locally, go to businesses that are paying the taxes, go to businesses that are paying fair living wage, that kind of thing to really support those that are in need and have been struggling. Fair very worthy. Emma? Uh, I like my New Year's resolutions to be very specific. So um, I've got many of them. One of my specific <laughs> year resolutions is um, I, I recently discovered that in, in Donegal in Ireland, you, there are, is, a, is a place where the seals come to watch um, people go swimming every morning. And so one of my New, New Year's resolutions is to go swimming in Donegal with seals. <laughs> oh, well, well I, I can't so, think of a better thing to do. <laughs> Sorry, somebody wanted to say something there. I just said, no. oh, wow. I mean, I've once seen penguins, <laughs> but never swum with seals. That's a wonderful <laughs> thing. That's well, my news resolution is to play a lot more golf so Rob Halfon can't build more houses where I play golf at Cromer. Uh, listen, thank, thank you all very much indeed. Emma Webb, Fran Darlington Pollock, Luciana Berger and Rob Halfon. We'll be back with Cross Question again tomorrow at 8. In the next hour, we're going to go back to our first question on Cross Question and talk about Sadiq Khan's plans to decriminalise minor cannabis offences in London. Well, when I say plans, he wants to launch a pilot scheme in three London boroughs. Is that the right thing to do? 0345 6060 973. Do you regard it as the first step to legalisation of at least class B drugs? Or do you think no, drug taste